we're here today to remember and celebrate the life of my father, architect Wilbert R. Hasbrook, who lived from December 17, 1931, until February 10, 2018. The Cliff Dwellers was one of his favorite places, not just because of the food or the view, but also because of the club's history, its members, and the many conversations he enjoyed with them over the years. He spent his last night out on January 8th of this year sitting at the members' table, right over here, at his usual place, facing the door and on the chair that bears his nameplate. It was his 54th consecutive annual meeting of the Cliff Dwellers. And that's something he was very proud of. On behalf of his entire family, I want to thank all of you for your kind words and condolences. I also want to take this opportunity to honor my mother, Marilyn Whittlesey Hasbrook, who was my father's partner in life for nearly 60 years. He always acknowledged her support and the fact that she contributed to all that he achieved, often sacrificing her own time and personal interests to do so. She accomplished a great deal in her own right, including establishing and operating the Prairie Avenue Bookshop. I always looked up to my father, and I still do. It's wonderful to see all of you here today and to know that his life's work, along with that of my mother, made a real difference in so many people's lives. And with that, I will turn the podium over to Bill Drennan, Secretary and Membership Committee Chairman of the Cliff Dwellers. Good afternoon. Over the past 50 plus years, anyone who spent any time involved with the Cliff Dwellers was certainly aware of Bill Hasbrook. Since his nomination to the club in 1964 by Ralph Fletcher Seymour, an original Cliff Dweller, Bill was a lunchtime regular in his seat at the head of the members' table. Everybody knew Bill's chair. Don't sit there. <laughs> as far as we know, Bill is the last of our members sponsored by an original member from among the 1907 founders. And so in many ways, it is most fitting that we gather here in our Kiva to remember and celebrate Bill. I have been asked to share a letter from our club president, Eve Moran, who is currently traveling in South America. Interestingly, Eve is the fourth woman to be president of the Cliff Dwellers and one of Bill Hasbrook's most significant and proudest achievements was the admission of women as members. Dear Marilyn, family, friends, colleagues, and fellow Cliff Dwellers, when I began my term as president of the Cliff Dwellers, I was deeply aware and admiring of those who served before me. Looming large in this group was, of course, Wilbert R. Hasbrook. Will served as club president 1984 and 85. Will was a legend in his own time, a highly accomplished man in the architectural field, a man supremely devoted to his family, a man that in so many different ways nurtured the arts, a man of strong and talented leadership whose presence at the members' table always lighted up the kiva. In short, Will was inspiration to me, and he remains inspiring still. When Will's son Charlie became president of the club in 2014, the legend took on new wings. For the first time in the club's history, a father and a son would each, in their respective times and expert ways, lead the club. A proud father, and his caring son would stand side by side in the photographs of past presidents taken regularly at the club's annual meeting. These are the moments that we strongly cherish. I honor you, Will. The club honors you. 
as is the cliff dwellers tradition, we cling to memories. We tell stories, and in doing so, keep vibrant the spirit of the best of us. You remain, dear Will, one of the very best and beloved of the cliff dwellers. Zibio, Eve Moran, president of the cliff dwellers. As uh, with both uh, Hasbrooks, uh, I'm a former president of the, the Cliff Dwellers, Bill Bow, and I joined in uh, 1997, two years after the club uh, moved here from the top of uh, Orchestra Hall next door. And uh, my only goal uh, when I joined was to get away from work. I worked uh, <laughs> uh, nearby. I didn't really want to talk to anybody. Uh, it was a way to just avoid uh, seeing all of my colleagues who I had uh, of course, up to here uh, the rest of the long day. So I came over here with my newspaper at first, and I sat uh, uh, reading at a table by myself. Uh, that plan did not last long, because the longtime dining room manager, whose portrait uh, graces our, our foyer, uh, Bob Tebow, uh, saw me do this, and I think it was the second time he came over, and in a voice that I couldn't really uh, uh, deal with uh, other than to follow it, he said, oh, Mr. Bo, please, you can't sit by yourself. You must sit at the members' table. And with that, he dragged me over and introduced me to Will Hasbrook. So over the next uh, 20 years, more often than not, I'd uh, be at that table and uh, be sitting next to Will uh, and uh, frequently uh, Marilyn as, as well. Uh, to say that uh, Will was an exceptional conversationalist doesn't really do him justice. He'd already by that time had a quite a diverse and successful set of uh, different uh, careers and he wasn't uh, by any means finished. And there wasn't once that I didn't go back to the office after lunch without learning from Will something new and interesting about Chicago architecture, history, or indeed life. It even turned out that he knew my uncle, Augustin Chabo, who at the uh, time they knew each other. Uh, my uncle, my father's brother, was the head of the city courts and uh, also uh, Mayor Richard J. Daly's first chair of the Chicago Architectural Commission. And they had been thrown together in an ill-fated attempt to save Adler and Sullivan's Garrick Theater, uh, uh, built, uh, as we all remember, uh, in 91, those of us that uh, were around at that time, of course. Uh, when I uh, first met him in 97, he had just started uh, work on his uh, grand scholarly achievement, the history of the Chicago Architectural Club. And it wasn't published for uh, almost 10 years, in 2005. And it was an amazing uh, nearly a decade's worth of labors. And in the bibliographic note at the end of this volume, uh, he gives full credit to Marilyn, not just for inspiring him to undertake the extraordinary effort that it took to uh, put into this. But she was uh, a, a, a collaborator, getting uh, traveling all over to different research points uh, and contributing the first draft of the extraordinary chronology that pulls the whole work together uh, and serves as an appendix and a backbone of the entire volume. And this, of course, was all the time all the time she was full-time at work uh, as president and manager of the bookshop. Um, the same year the book was uh, published, I remember Will explaining to me at lunch that they had had a, an extraordinary uh, windfall at the bookshop, uh, the most profitable time. Uh, and I asked, what, what happened? Uh, did you get a convention in town of, of architects? He said, no. Hollywood. And sure enough, he told me that uh, location uh, seekers for a movie uh, called The Lake House, uh, starring uh, Keanu Reeves and Christopher Plummer and Sandra Bullock, had rented the entire bookstore uh, at such a price you couldn't possibly turn it down, and they converted it into an architect's office for one scene in which the father and son architects in the movie uh, argue aesthetics 
uh, as the L train rumbles uh, by uh, overhead. Uh, I promptly accepted uh, Will's invitation then to walk uh, around the corner here uh, to Wabash and visit the movie set. And it, was it was really something uh, because they had turned what was, of course, an amazing bookstore into an amazing architect's office through the genius of the set decorators. The next time I saw uh, Will, he told me that he had accepted uh, a nice luncheon invitation from Keanu Reeves at the Four Seasons. Apparently, Reeves was playing an architect and thought it couldn't hurt to actually talk to one. <laughs> uh, the, clearly, uh, the conversation was clearly of interest to both men because Will told me that uh, when they had finished uh, uh, lunch, uh, he invited uh, Reeves to join him over a pot of Maryland's coffee over at their apartment uh, on East Delaware, and uh, the conversation continued there. <coughs> Though I don't know what they talked about at lunch, I'd bet my bottom dollar that Keanu Reeves left that lunch and that afternoon coffee session uh, knowing something new about Chicago architecture history or life or all of the above. Charlie has told me that I have to condense two hours into under five minutes. So I had to write it down so that I don't ramble. <clears throat> Almost after, after almost 20 years working in bookstores and art galleries in New York and London, when I first walked into the Prairie Avenue bookstore in 1980, I instantly knew I was in the presence of kindred spirits. They were Bill and Marilyn Hosbrook. Actually, I knew even before I walked in, the shop window was itself a work of art. The most memorable object on display was a plaster head of a sprite from Frank Lloyd Wright's Midway Gardens, long since demolished. There was also a beautiful Tico pot and, of course, some wonderful books. My first acquisition from them was a major one, a set of stained glass windows from Wright's Walzer house, which had been removed by the owner. The house was badly neglected and the windows were being vandalized. Bill and Marilyn were among the most important pioneering leaders of the architectural preservation movement in Chicago and the Midwest. In those days, architectural preservationists were often derided as little old ladies in tennis shoes. I wouldn't be surprised if Marilyn is still wearing those tennis shoes. <laughs> Some years after I met them, I came across an old news clipping with a picture of them picketing in front of the Art Institute, protesting against the desecration of the Ferguson Public Sculpture Trust by the museum's trustees. Many years ago, I was almost thrown out of this club for writing about the Ferguson scandal in the newsletter. But that's a long story, better told over several scotches by the fire. <clears throat> When Bill became a member in the early 60s, as Bill said, this, his sponsor was the legendary etcher, printer, and all-around bookman Ralph Fletcher Seymour, one of the founding cliff dwellers. I believe this made Bill the last living link to the club's origin. And of course, Ralph Fletcher Seymour goes back even farther than 1907 when the club was founded to the group that met in Ralph Clarkson's studio in the Fine Arts Building uh, as early as 1905 or even earlier. <clears throat> I remember my father, who was never a member himself, but was invited to lunch frequently by architects and artists who were, talking glowingly at our dinner table about the somewhat seedy elegance of the old club rooms above Orchestra Hall. So it was a great thrill for me to become a member myself in the early 80s. I succeeded Joe Shapiro as chair of the art committee and Harry Malm as 
editor of the newsletter, and during those years, Bill Hosbrook was my most dependable inspiration, loyal ally, and good friend. Bill was not only the quintessential cliff dweller, but the most knowledgeable, erudite, and passionate advocate of Chicago's artistic, architectural, and cultural history I have had the privilege to know. I use the word passionate, and yet he was much more than that. He was a realist and was rarely, if ever, merely sentimental about old buildings. His tennis shoes will be hard to fill. Oh, and one more thing I'd like to mention. We did have more than a few good laughs along the way. Thank you. My name is Ann Sullivan. I'm the John Bryan Chair of Historic Preservation at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Bill gave me my first job in historic preservation. I was a college kid studying architecture. I was curious about the field of historic preservation. He hired me for the summer, where I was exposed to amazing buildings that summer, like the Dana Thomas House and the Rookery, and where I had the opportunity to work with colleagues who've gone on to be leaders in our field, Harry Hunderman and Deborah Slayton, Carl Giegold, Leslie Gilmore, and of course, Charlie Hasbrook. From that point on, my career course was set as a preservation architect. But I'm here this afternoon to talk about Bill's influence upon preservation education in this city. In the late 1980s, Bill felt that the city of Chicago should have a first class graduate program in historic preservation to rival that at Columbia University in New York. So he approached Don Kalick. Don had led the restoration efforts at the Frank Lloyd Wright Home and Studio and was teaching full time at the Art Institute at that point. As a result, the master's degree program in historic preservation was started in 1992 at the school, for which Don was the first director, then Vince Michael, and now myself. Bill taught in the program for a number of years and personally influenced a generation of young people who have gone on to work in Chicago and throughout the country and in the field of historic preservation, many of whom are in this room. And for that legacy, we thank you, Bill. Uh, my name is Bill Tyre. I'm the executive director and curator at the Glessner House. And uh, my first encounter with Bill Hasbrook was actually in the master's program that Ann just talked about at the Art Institute uh, 20 years ago. And uh, one of the things I remember as I was putting down my notes today was all the other instructors in the program, we always referred to by their first name. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Hasbrook was always Mr. Hasbrook. And even after we became colleagues, I always had to pause for a moment because my tendency was to say Mr. before I said Bill. Um, my master's thesis was on Prairie Avenue. So as I was starting to research the topic while I was in school, I was surprised and very pleased to find that Bill Hasbrook had been deeply involved in uh, founding Glessner House and the Chicago Architecture Foundation. It was back in November of 1963 that he met with the owner of the building, um, along with the Secretary of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks in Marion Dupre, and first became aware of the fact that the house was going to be put up for sale. Um, although it was designated a landmark, at that point it was a purely honorary designation and so there was genuine concern about the future of the building. At that time, he was serving as the chairman of the Preservation Committee of the Chicago chapter of the American Institute of Architects. And soon after that meeting, he reported back to them um, and said in part, regardless of what final use is made of this building, I feel the AIA must take a major advisory role in its disposition. The Glessner House is too important a structure to go the way of the Garrick. Of course, the reference to the Garrick Theater lost in 1961. In April 1966, when the Chicago School of Architecture Foundation was formed specifically to purchase and maintain the building, 
Bill was among the 20 individuals, 19 men and one woman, that uh, were organized officially for that purpose. And he became deeply involved over the next decade. By December of that year, he was appointed the second president of the board, serving for four years. In 1971, he became one of the scholars, both as architect and preservationist, that helped to lead our first docent training program, um, teaching classes to several years of docents. His interest in the neighborhood extended beyond Glessner House, and a few years later, uh, he and his wife purchased the Elbridge Keith House, one block to the south, which had also gone up for sale and was um, in danger of demolition. And of course, that became the home and namesake of the Prairie Avenue Bookshop and operated there until 1978. His additional work with Glessner House included the restoration of the kitchen wing, the first interior restoration project of the house. And I remember a few years ago, um, as um, his office was, was being cleaned out, we were de delighted to receive some of those original files and photographs and things that showed just the, the depth of research that he undertook to make sure that the project was as um, accurate as possible. Possibly his most visible project down in the neighborhood involved the relocation and restoration of the Henry B. Clark House. Uh, he received that project in 1975, completing the, um, completing the move two years later. And as he noted to uh, Susan Benjamin, who actually um, interviewed him several years later, he said during the move of the Clark House was the one and only time he was ever asked for his autograph. <laughs> so um, in 2016, um, I had the privilege, along with Lynn Osmond um, of CAF, to honor uh, five of the founders of the organization and, um, at Glessner House. And of course, Bill was among that group. And I'm delighted that we had the opportunity at that time to acknowledge him, his services to Glessner House and CAF over 50 years, and his lasting impact on the field of preservation in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Jackson, and I had the privilege of working with Bill on the restoration of the Dana Thomas House. For five years, basically from 1985 to 1990, this project was completed. Will was selected to be the project architect. I was part of a team. The, the, guy, the head of our team was called Jim Thompson. You might remember him. <laughs> he, it was great to have the full support of the governor behind you. And Don Hallmark and Jim Reamer and I were the state's point person. But Bill was the guy that led the team and led the effort. And it was an excellent effort. The project speaks for itself. But I, I've always been wondering about the, the how we did it. And Wright designed this with a small team of people and a few drawings and a few specs. But when the state of Illinois does something, we just take a different approach. So 150 drawings and 2,000 specifications later, the responsible low bidder got the job done because Will Hasbrook was in charge of this project. The house speaks for itself as one of the best restorations of any of the right houses, and Will should be proud of that accomplishment. Our story didn't end there. I've never given up on the importance of the Dana House. And so, kind of in conclusion about this, last year we took on a project to re-photograph the interiors of the Dana House matching the Wasmuth photographs. So we needed a copy of the Wasmuth portfolio of photographs. I called up Will Hasbrook. Yeah, well, have you got a copy that we can use to, to borrow that, to look at, to scan, to use? He said, sure, no problem. I'll leave them for you at the Cliff Dwellers. You can come by and pick them up, and then just give it back to me when you're done with it. And that we did. So we re-photographed, matching. We're still part of the story, telling the story of this great achievement in preservation. It's a legacy that will live on. I'm very proud to have been part of that team that worked with him that did that. Thanks, Will. My name is Judy Hasbrook Rafferty. I'm Bill's sister. Bill. Bill was nine years old when I was born. I was always known with affection as the kid. I would like to share some fond memories and personal stories that made my brother such a unique and amazing person. 
He was creative, artistic, and imaginative. When I remember Bill, Bill being 13 and me being a four-year-old little kid sister, I recall how much I absolutely adored him and I wanted to be just like him in every respect. Three instances of his creative and artistic ability come to mind. He was fascinated by anything that would fly, airplanes, gliders. He designed and constructed a homemade kite made out of newspaper, wooden slats, and scraps of fabric tied to string for the tail of that kite. My mother, father, brother, Bill and myself trudged up a hill on the farm and he released that homemade kite and it just soared that day off into the sky on the very first try. What a sight. And he was ecstatic. I will never forget how excited he was that his project literally got off the ground. <laughs> then there was his chemistry set. And my parents hoping he wouldn't burn the house down. But he was very careful and it never happened. But he did make some very interesting concoctions. <laughs> but one of the most telling time I vividly remember was Bill sitting at the kitchen table with pencil and paper, drawing elaborate circles and squares and rectangles, wheels and cogs, riggings and pulleys, and I sat down beside him, now I was about five years old at this time, and I asked him, what is that? And he continued to sketch, filling it in, and then he put his pencil down, and he looked at me, and he said, that's my invention. Oh yes, he was creative and artistic, but there was the imaginative and sometimes teasing, storytelling side of Bill, especially to his little sister. I was five years old when I started kindergarten, and the day before I was to enter that stage of my life, he gave me some very insightful and discerning advice Judy, no talking, <laughs> no chewing gum, and do everything your teacher says, because Mr. Lillian, Mr. Lillian Grimm, the superintendent, has a spanking machine in his office, <laughs> and he will use it, because... Well, needless to say, because of that sage advice, my year in kindergarten went very well, <laughs> indeed. Bill lived a life to the fullest and would want us to celebrate his accomplishments. I will miss my brother more than words can say. Hello everybody, I'm John Hasbrook and I'd like to thank everybody for being here on behalf of my mother and my brother and the rest of my family that's here. Marilyn has a story she likes to tell about the fact that uh, I was born basically at the same moment that the Prairie School Press got off the ground. <laughs> the way she tells the story is that uh, my dad went to visit his wife and new baby at the hospital and she said, see my new baby? And he said, see my new book? 
<laughs> My dad and I almost never discussed architecture. I can count on my hands. But I did, uh, I was under the influence of the Prairie School Review uh, very much growing up. There's people here who tell me I, they grew up with the Prairie School Review. No, I grew up with the Prairie School Review. <laughs> it, I was under influence uh, quite literally. Uh, my earliest memory at age two is playing beneath the dining room table uh, upon which Bill and Marilyn laid out the Prairie School Review for the entire duration of its uh, publication. And that dining room table is in my dining room now. Um, when I was about nine, uh, Santa Claus showed up with a calligraphy set for, for me and one for Charlie. Charlie did not take an interest, so I took his and made this huge calligraphy set. And Bill and Marilyn noticed my interest in this, and the next time Santa Claus came around, he gave, I got an Instamatic camera. And more important, a kid's darkroom set. So now I had my whole graphic design shop gone here. Um, I didn't realize that the, who was directing this, but I know now. But uh, one thing, the, those cameras, after I got that darkroom set, 11 months later on my birthday, they brought home uh, 10 antique cameras that they bought for 5 and $10 a piece at antique shops. I still have those cameras. I did with them what any red-blooded American boy would do, I took them apart. <laughs> when I got into my teenage years, I developed other interests, one of which was music, guitar. I wanted to play rock and roll guitar. So I got myself a guitar. I was kind of a slow learner, but I eventually learned to play a little bit. I learned to play a, a three-chord blues chord progression, and my dad was in the room at the time, and he, he got up out of his chair, and he walked over and he said, well, well, you can play. I said, yeah, I could play this song. You know? and, and then he said the most incredible, profound thing I have ever heard him say before or since. He said, you know, I once bought Muddy Waters a beer. <laughs> mind blown. Four, I was 14. To this day, my mind is blown by that information. <laughs> But maybe a year later, uh, he came home one day and he was kind of grumpy. I think he'd had a bad day at the office and I was chattering about the, the afternoon's band rehearsal and blah, blah, blah. And he suddenly bellowed, well, you'll never be Eric Clapton. <laughs> well, the relative merits of Mr. Clapton's work notwithstanding, this was a bit of a little harsh for uh, the 15-year-old upcoming rocker in the 1970s in Midwestern United States. But what are you going to do? I didn't know what he meant. I still don't really know. But a couple years later, I graduated, barely, from high school. And uh, I remember that summer, I was working on my career of bagging groceries for the local grocery store and um, sitting in front of the TV and dutifully rehearsing my band, waiting for something to happen. And uh, one afternoon, summer afternoon, my dad came up to me and he said, John, you know, there's a place where you can study guitar. Like, it's like a guitar school. And it's at a university. Not far from here, Northern Illinois University. Now, I was 17. It had never occurred to me to consider college, even though that was my parents' biggest dream. Bill in Maryland. Um, he said, would you like to go there? And without looking away from the TV, I said, sure. <laughs> A couple weeks later, he came home from work again. And uh, let me tell you just for a moment about our house in Palis Park. This was a house designed and executed by my dad. And it had a sloping stone driveway that came up to a two-car garage that had a a high brick wall that was adjacent to our living room. And, and if you're a kid home alone in this living room, you could see the headlights coming up the driveway if the parental units were coming home. And you could maybe do what you had to do to get everything together, hide any contraband or anything like that. <laughs> you had about one minute. And then uh, when, when the, they walked up the, the, the porch, they come up to the front door, Tim, who, who, where's the front door from? 
The Babson House. The Babson House. We had the front door from the Babson House at our house in Palis Park. And on this night, the, I saw my dad come in. You could, there's a big window also. You could see who's going to ring the doorbell. My dad shows up at the door. I see him. He's got a guitar. Why does he have, he's got a guitar with no case. I'm completely flummoxed. I don't know what's going on. I later, I, I later learned that uh, in order to get into NIU's classical guitar department, you needed a nylon string guitar. And he had gone to some pawn shop <laughs> and spent $45 on a beat up nylon string guitar that is the most wonderful thing anybody has ever given me. So that's pretty much the whole story of how I got two careers being guided by Marilyn and Bill. Um, at this time, well, let me just finish the story. I didn't do so hot um, academically at NIU, but because of the circumstances of my enrollment, I was a sponsored student. student. They placed me in a dormitory that was 100% music majors, and I proceeded to have my first total immersion educational experience. And I owe it all to my mom and dad. At this time, I want to uh, read something on behalf of Marilyn. One Sunday morning, Bill received a phone call from Mrs. Presto. Her husband had worked for Louis Sullivan, and she wanted to sell some drawings. Bill offered her what we had in the bank after the usual quarterly publication of our magazine, and then offered his condolences for her husband. She replied, ah, hell, he was 78. <laughs> we wrote the check, and several months later, a rolled-up package of drawings arrived. They were exquisite. Bill loved to tell this story. Sometimes I think Mrs. Presto was on to something. An architect lives for his dreams, and then there comes a time when dreams evaporate. Bill lived his dreams, working on the master's buildings, discovering the followers massive output across the Midwest, tracing the emergence of the American architectural profession in Chicago in the 1890s. He loved every minute of it. He lived his dream and was honored by, for both his restoration archite architecture and scholarly work. I am proud to have known him. And now I have the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing our last speaker, a gentleman who has been helping me uh, the past few weeks go through Bill's papers. We know there's at least one book in there and there's a lot of family photos that you can see on the wall over there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Chicago's the official cultural historian for the city of Chicago, a man who knows more about my family than I do, <laughs> Tim Samuelson. Well, Cultural historian. People wonder, what's that all about? How do you get a job like that? Well, you have to have a good teacher. And that's where Bill Hasbrook comes into the picture. Now, I was just kind of a history nerd as a kid, with a specialty in architecture, especially Chicago architecture. And if you were interested in that topic in the 1960s, there weren't any schools that you could really go to that specialized in this or gave you that kind of information. But there was something that I knew, and I was just a teenager, and I would save up my allowance money and I would go to downtown Chicago to that late great bookstore, Crocs and Brentanos. <laughs> and up on the second floor, in the days before the Prairie Avenue bookstore, the great muse to all people seeking what was new in art and architecture books, the great Mr. Henry Tabor. And there would be this little white magazine. And Henry would say, there's a new copy here for you. This is the Prairie School Review. I still laugh when I think about how it seemed like I was paying a fortune for the cover price of $1.50. And if it was a larger issue, they were 250. But what you found in those magazines. Now at this point, I knew Bill and Marilyn Hasbrook as the name in the magazine. But what there was, there would be stories about the familiar architects like Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright, Daniel Burnham. 
but there would be things in there that you didn't know about them at all. It was the only place you could find it. There would be essays that were sent in about architects that I had never heard of. In fact, in many ways, the people who contributed to this magazine actually put before the world and revived the reputations of lost architects like Ernest Wood, Frederick Schock, and names like Percy Bentley, and actually then elevated them into the pantheon of architects to be studied. This was the legacy of the Prairie School Review. But it wasn't just that, the logo with the little drawing of the prairie urn on it. There also is the fact is that Bill Hasbrook was the intrepid hunter of rare books. He could almost wear a pith helmet in this time when he was going in his off hours working for the Illinois Central Railroad, going down to the old bookstores like Economy, ABC, and gathering rare volumes before they disappeared altogether. Things like Harriet Monroe's biography of John Welburn Root. I lusted for one of those as a kid. I asked for it for Christmas, but nobody could find one. But then Bill takes the copy that he had retrieved, probably at some dusty bookstore a long time ago, reproduced it exactly. I had my copy. Thank you, Bill. I still have it. It's all marked up as I hold it around the south side, trying to find all the houses in the building list at the back, most of the time coming back with vacant lots, but that's what happens. But then I get to meet Bill and Marilyn themselves, and this is part of my education because Bill became my answer man on things. And there was no question that you could ask him about Chicago architects that he couldn't answer. And actually, in many cases, he had personally met many of the older practitioners of Chicago's architecture or their families. He had had and rescued their papers before they disappeared into oblivion and then published them in his magazine and shared them. When I would ask a question about to Bill, he would answer the question, and if he couldn't quite think of it, he would come up with some rare volume or magazine which he would get the answer from it. And if I asked if I could borrow it, sure, take it home, as was said before, bring it back when you're done. Now, Marilyn kind of looked after this in a way, but he always liked to loan me books because I always brought them back. And so I enjoyed doing that. I think I first met Bill when I was 17 years old, and this continued for literally 50 years. Now, the other thing that is interesting with Bill is he was an amazing scholar. And in addition to publishing things in the Prairie School Review and gathering the work of architectural historians, and there being a forum where they could have voice to their scholarship, he was an incredible scholar himself. And certainly evidence of that is sitting right on the table over there, actually many things on the table, but the history of the Chicago Architectural Club, which is one of the most definitive, detailed histories that give you a picture of Chicago architecture in the late 19th and early 20th century that you'll ever find. Look in its index, and you will find references to architects, forgotten the history, but not only in the book, but documented with footnotes that are impeccable and can lead you to other places. All 640 pages of that book. And it also, not only being a ready resource for me, when I have old antique papers that have somehow gotten folded and I want to flatten them out. <laughs> I set that book on there and it saved many a, a historic document. <laughs> now in regard to Bill, the scholar, in fact even to think about in remembering him today, and I have been helping John as we go through sorting Bill's papers, one of his great passions was the life and work of the great architect 
Dwight Hale Perkins, who was also a member of the Cliff Dwellers, was one of the fathers of modern school design. And for years, Bill gathered material with the idea of creating the definitive biography of him. And he's worked over the years for it. We have found the notes and gathered them up in the apartment. What is it now, John? Uh, ten boxes, ten, boxes. ten uh, document one. boxes and counting. There are chapters that are finished, and basically he got pretty close. But it was very interesting. His devotion to this book was so strong that as he started to realize the onset of illness, that it became a race between his life and creating this book. And he got so close. We have the chapters in finished form. He wanted the hardest part for any author is to create the last summation, the final chapter, and the kind of the go through and get things tightened up. He almost got there, but didn't. Now this reminds me of a bit of historical background and involves the cliff dwellers. In the late 1930s, one of the early members of this club, Thomas Eddie Talmadge, one of the biographers of uh, Chicago's architectural history, was making a book documenting the history of Chicago architecture. And also he gathered the voices of many of the actual practitioners of that era. The book was nearing completion and he unexpectedly died in a train wreck. What happened? The members of the cliff dwellers, the people from the architectural history community who are interested, pooled together and finished that book. And that is the book we now know as Architecture in Old Chicago. It's great. So if I think about what would be a great way to honor and memorialize Bill, love to finish this book and I'm looking out at an amazing pool of knowledge and expertise and we could do what people did for Thomas Eddy Talmadge in 1930 and this will be even a bigger book and a lot more pages too <laughs> and in the end I would have to say there's as far as remembering Bill I mean Bill's still very much with us Bill's in our heart Bill is in our minds with what he taught us and also, of course, what he put on our bookshelf. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all the speakers here tonight and uh, I want to thank all of you, too, for coming. I am completely overwhelmed by this crowd and the, the, the people here. Uh, the, the Cliff Dwellers is founded for a place for artists and patrons of the arts to come together and enjoy each other's company and engage in conversation. And I hope you'll all in, enjoy today and continue that conversation and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.